So with the Atlantic salmon population declining, we're losing part of the vital link between freshwater and the marine realm. With uh, fewer spawners returning to breed, this means that we have fewer spawners dying on the spawning grounds. So the nutrients that they accumulate during their time at sea aren't being returned to freshwater systems in the amounts that they were when populations were higher. And this can impact uh, juvenile fish. So these uh, juvenile salmon might be missing out on increased growth uh, and that could as a result impact population dynamics. So we know that juveniles in areas with carcasses uh, have a greater length and a biomass uh, because of uh, invertebrate increases in invertebrate abundance in biomass. And that means that uh, these juveniles are increasing in growth, which is uh, ultimately helping their sort of sea survival. So uh, as Keith has shown, um, as we see the uh, with the increase in, in carcass additions, we have a corresponding increase in the log biomass of uh, juvenile salmon. So this has implications in terms of management. Perhaps replacing these nutrients that we've lost could be used as a conservation tool. If we try and help these juvenile fish to attain a greater body size by uh, restoring nutrients to these systems, perhaps more of these fish are going to survive uh, to spawning. But crucially, we don't know the best way to apply this tool. So for my PhD, I've been investigating uh, various methods into this nutrient application. And my first experiment involved a comparison between uh, using uh, carcass analogs, so uh, basically salmon uh, fish food pellets. And these were, could be either applied in kind of a bagged form, so essentially more similar to a sort of salmon carcass. It's larger, uh, but it needs to be sort of dug into the substrate so that it's not sort of removed by flow or predators. But obviously then that means an increase sort of in the workload of, of fisheries managers. So perhaps an easier alternative might be simply just to scatter the pellets into the streams. That can be done from the bank, so it's quite minimal effort. But because these pellets are quite small, they could be more easily removed by flow. But they could work their way into sort of the interstitial spaces in the, in the substrate. But the effects of these scattered pellets haven't been studied. So uh, I undertook uh, my research uh, in the Conan system uh, with the help of the Cromarty uh, Fisheries Trust, uh, particularly with uh, Ross and uh, Ben and Ed. Um, so this was on four uh, tributaries of the River Blackwater over six different sites. So within each site, uh, there was a sort of upstream section with a downstream, um, an upstream control paired with a downstream treatment zone. And these uh, treatments were either bagged or scattered. So we had three of each and each one received the same quantity of nutrients. So about 15 kilos, but this was either uh, kind of scattered or bagged pellets. And within each uh, sort of site, we had 2,500 eggs planted out, and these were from the same 25 families to control for genetic effects. So the families were created in 2019, and then in 20, early 2020, the eggs and nutrients were planted out, and then re we returned for uh, data collection in uh, that September. So now I'm just going to walk through a couple of the results. So. Firstly, uh, for the fork length of fry, we actually didn't see a significant difference between the control and the bagged treatment, but we did see actually a 2% significant decrease in the fork length of fish in the scattered treatment. So although this is only uh, over a small scale, it was still a decrease, but this might be partially explained by what we saw when we looked at the density. Again, we saw no difference between the control and the bag treatment, but we did see an almost 74% increase, uh, significant increase uh, in fry density in this scattered treatment. 
So this was uh, quite surprising initially that this these bagged pellets didn't have an effect as sort of when we returned to the sites, we could sort of observe this sort of plume of algae uh, near the uh, bagged pellets. But perhaps that's affecting sort of individual fish territories rather than the stream, rather than a wider area. And perhaps the scattered treatment might be increasing sort of initial survival. So this was uh, positive in, in some ways for density. Um, and But is there a sort of way that we can look to improve growth, which was what we were really looking for? Because this increase in density seemed to come at this cost of growth. So my next experiment was to use a sort of multiple dose experiment, because with the uh, demand for energy and nutrients being high in, in the streams in the summer, perhaps an additional dose uh, in the summer period could help to uh, provide a boost to the growth of these fish. So my next experiment used uh, only the scattered treatment and we applied uh, a single dose or a double dose uh, against the control. So again, this was an, in the same kind of system, uh, but this time using some, some sites on uh, the main stem of the Blackwater as well. And now I'm just going to go through the same set of results, uh, but for, for this experiment. So when we come to, to the fork length of fry, uh, we actually saw no significant difference this time between the control and the single dose, which was the same as the sort of scattered dose before. But at the double dose, we saw a significant increase of almost 7% in, in fork length. So this seemed to be sort of what we were looking for. Then uh, looking again at density, we saw uh, a significant increase in density uh, in the single dose. So uh, a repeat of the first result from the previous experiment and uh, a similar increase in density with the double dose uh, of marginally higher uh, in this one. So it seems like these uh, so it seems like these are sort of increasing the initial survival in just a single dose, but the double dose is seeming to have uh, this sort of boost to growth that's needed to sustain this perhaps initially increased population. But what are the long term impacts from this increase in growth? Is it going to result in more smolts and will that result in more returning uh, spawners? Or is it just going to mean uh, an increase in the numbers of uh, precocious par? And might it result in more smolts that are younger uh, and smaller? So they might not be, uh, they might not be as uh, effective at surviving at sea. So because I can't answer these questions with fieldwork during my PhD, I, I turn to modeling. So now I'm going to present some uh, results of some models that I've been working on. And these models simulate uh, different uh, si simulate a population of, of uh, salmon uh, under different growth scenarios. So there'll be uh, a 5, 10, 15 and 20 percent increase in uh, the sort of initial body size of the fish. So it's simulating different levels of uh, nutrient input. So firstly, if we look at the number of precocious par, uh, and then against the increases in, in body size, we are actually seeing an increased number of precocious par as body size is increasing. So, uh, but then if we move on to look at the number of uh, smolts being produced, we are seeing uh, quite a large increase in the number of uh, smolts. So we've almost got um, 150, uh, 150 more smolts, uh, just 5% increase in growth. Um, and I think around 350 at the sort of a, a high level of increased growth. So then just to drill down on that a little bit further to, to uncover some of the patterns uh, that we're seeing driving this, we are seeing, uh, so Im importantly on this, uh, on these, just note that the axes are on very different sort of scales here. So for fish smolting at one, so quite a sort of rare event, um, we're seeing kind of a, quite a handful of fish uh, smolting at this age. And this, the rest of the pattern seems to be mostly driven by uh, an in a large increase in the number of fish smolting at two. With uh, smolts uh, at older ages, uh, having sort of fewer numbers as uh, more fish in the 
higher numbers are smolting earlier, so there's uh, less of them left in the population. So they're remaining in fresh water for a shorter amount of time, so uh, less um, sort of exposed to uh, mortality in the freshwater realm. So then how does that translate into the number of fish uh, returning? So it looks like uh, we are seeing an uh, increased, uh, on average, number of fish returning at this with just this increase in body size. Um, but this is obviously can quite ver can be quite variable depending on uh, sort of the initial size of fish and how the population developed. And then finally, if we look at the number of uh, offspring being produced, so the number of fry. My models start out with a population of 15,000 fish, so that's indicated by this uh, dotted line. So if we look at the uh, zero sort of percent uh, body size increase, so the control essentially, we're seeing a declining population where there might be some years that are uh, good, but um, mostly the population seems to be in decline. And that's also the case for uh, the 5% with the average just being uh, below. But again, there is a lot of variability among that. But then uh, at the larger body sizes, we're seeing um, an increasing or growing population. So with an increase of 7%, uh, uh, um, I found with my experiment, it's kind of hitting uh, just around here. So we are seeing um, potentially uh, a, a sustainable population. But of course, uh, these are just models and not um, sort of necessarily um, the most accurate reflection of what is going on in individual rivers. So then uh, in summary, um, just sort of discussed how the uh, nutrient uh, additions might be, might be a benefit as a conservation tool. Uh, increasing the density and the size of fish if we use a, a double dose approach. So that has uh, implications for conservation. But importantly, it's uh, essential that these nutrients are applied in a careful manner because obviously these systems are uh, quite fragile and um, so it should be undertaken on a sort of adaptive, uh, adaptive manner. So uh, this is just a sort of insight into the potential that uh, nutrient additions uh, have for uh, salmon populations. So with that, uh, I'd just like to thank my supervisors, Neil Metcalf and John Armstrong, and then everyone that's helped with my field work, uh, particularly Ross and, um, and Ben and Ed from Reconnen. Um, so, uh, and with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.